bunch of paperwork though. I did a bunch of paperwork though, but I am running out of time. For sure. I'm a little stressed. I'm a little stressed, but we're all We're halfway there. How are you? Well, we just want to take these moments to welcome you to service, whether you're here in this room or you're tuning in. It is so great just to come together in, in, in one heart, one mind, just to lift high the name of Jesus, just to give him the glory, the honor, the reverence, just the praise that he deserves. And you know, this month is, or today of our first of the month is our first Fresh Fruit Sunday. You know, where we're setting aside time, just surrendered and submitted before the Father in worship and in communion. And as we as we spend time in, in that prayer, as we spend time in that worship, you know, I challenge you to push aside the distractions, the things, you know, that have been you've been facing all week, all month, or whatever the situation is, and fix your eyes on the cross. You know, last week we celebrated the death and resurrection of Jesus, and so, you know, that's an overflow. You know, we don't have to only celebrate it once a year, but, you know, it's in a continuation of what Christ has done. So, Jesus, Lord, this morning, God, we just thank you. God, we honor you. Jesus, Lord, this morning, God, we just want to start this morning off right, Father God, by praising you, by honoring you, by glorifying you. Jesus, you are the name above all names. You are holy. You are worthy. And, Father God, this morning, we just submit and surrender. God, we ask you, Lord, to come and have your way. Jesus, we just ask you, Lord, that your will would be done. But, Father God, this morning, we just ask you, Lord, that your presence would just move in this place, Father. God, that you would touch every circumstance and situation. But, Jesus, ultimately, Lord, we just thank you. We praise you. We give you the glory, the honor, and the praise. And it's only because of you. So, Jesus, we worship you.
God, we come before you this morning, oh God, to praise your holy name, to worship you corporately, to lift the name of Jesus above all names. Oh, Father God, you are worthy. Lord God, you are worthy. God, I thank you for your presence even now, Lord God. And God, we humble ourselves before you. We humble ourselves, oh God, and we come. What the scripture says that we have the right to come boldly before that throne of grace and mercy. Every time we sing that song, I get tripped up on those words. Was I on his mind as he knelt in the garden? Was my soul on his mind? Was yours? Think about that for a moment. That even though we weren't born, he still thought of us. You know, for so many that struggle with doubt, with rejection, with depression, to even think of yourself as a prize is hard to grasp, isn't it? Yet you're part of the Lord's prize. When you surrender before him, when you call out to him as Lord and Savior, your heart is his prize. Your heart is what he went to the cross for. Your soul, that, that, that wanting that relationship restored, wanting you back in relationship. God, we cry out to you this morning. And Father God, we ask that even now, Lord God, that you would search your heart as David penned, God, search our heart for any evil, wicked way within us and cleanse us. as we go into your word, Lord Jesus, I ask that you would transform us by washing us with your word. Oh God, how we need you. God, I need you today more than yesterday. Father God, I don't want to take a single step, a single breath without you. want to lean on my own understanding, but God, I want to put my faith and my hope in you, who is the author and the finisher of my faith. God, let your, let you, let, let, let every moment of my day, let my heart be connected to yours. Let me do, don't let me wander on my own. Don't let me go to my own ways. But God, I pray that every moment we would go to take a misstep, that your angels, that your Holy Spirit would quicken into our heart. And Lord God, that we would come running back. The Bible says that many will fall away. And God, I'm asking that right now, Lord God, that you would ignite a passion with inside of each of us that cannot be quenched. God, that you would keep us alert. Help us, oh God, to stay in our word, to stay in prayer, to stay connected to the vine. God, that you would move inside of each of us. Father God for who you are I 
thank you, God, that we are a new creation in you. God, right now, we lift up every need in this place. God, I ask that you would begin to move on health situations, family situations, financial breakthroughs, Lord, for jobs, for houses, Lord God. You see every need, and I'm asking that you would move right now. God, I pray for Commander. God, and I ask that you would strengthen his body. God, that your Holy Spirit would fill that hospital room right where he's at. God, I thank you that no matter what he faces, that he's still singing the good old hymns, Lord God, that he's still testifying the goodness of God. And what a testimony that is for the rest of us. Now, Father God, I ask that you would just open our ears and our understanding as we dive into your word. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Everyone said... Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Kids, you may be dismissed. <laughs> Couple quick announcements. Um, there are lots of things coming up. Please keep an eye out for your emails or there's a flyer out there that has some of the dates on. This coming Friday, we are having a game night. Um, it's a Friday instead of a Saturday, a little bit different. Um, the last one worked really well. So what we want you guys to do is bring your favorite board game, bring a snack to share, and just get ready to have some fun. This is not our mystery night, so this is our board game night. So come out, have some fun. Ladies, this is the last week for, uh, the last day for sign up for the uh, spring tour. It is coming up. If you you are planning on going with us, please put your name on the list. I need to purchase tickets tomorrow. Um, otherwise, please give me a call and let me know. Uh, we are going to have a great time of going out and just being fed spiritually in the word and in fellowship. We always have a good time driving out there. I'll be taking the van down so you don't have to drive. Um, but please either sign up or see me and we'll get your name on that list. Okay. Amen. You guys excited? No, no one's excited. A couple people. Are you guys excited? Yes. All right. You're excited about the eclipse, aren't you? <laughs> it's not the end of the world. Well, if it is, then I won't have a board meeting tomorrow, and it'll be okay then. Um, we're going to get back in the book of Revelation. We took a time off uh, for Good Friday and uh, Easter holiday, so... We're going to be in chapter 6 today, and I titled this, So It Begins. You know, with God, when God begins to start to do something, he, he, does, he sees it through, amen? And, you know, we've seen from chapter 4 and 5 where we left off a few weeks ago, John's with, in heaven, he has his vision, he's, he sees the angels, and he sees the throne room of God, and, and they're praising God, and they're worshiping God, and, and how many know that God's in control? No matter what is going on around you, God is in control. No matter what you see, God is in control. And I know we look at our society today and you see earthquake here, earthquake here. You know, earthquakes have been going on since the beginning. It's nothing a big deal. It's, it is a big deal, but they've been going on for a long time. A lot of things have been going on in this earth since the fall. And one of the things when I, was, when I was a kid, and I don't know about you, when I was a kid growing up, and it, it came with me as an adult, I used to like sitting on my porch. We had, a, we had a back porch in our house where I grew up. And when it started to rain, I used to go out there and just sit. When I was a kid, I'd be playing with something. But I always liked the, the raindrops. And when it hit the, hit the, hit the roof, and it came to me in, in, my, in my adulthood, is that I just loved to sit and not in the rain, but sit there and just, it, it's just a peaceful sign to me. But I noticed those in, a lot of times in the summer months that um, we get those sudden storms, but There'd be like a, an eerie or a foreboding calm before the storm would come, amen? You get the sense of this, something is in the air. And one can almost feel this, the violent storm is about to break. And I think that's what we're about to experience in our world today. And I'm not just saying in the United States, because a lot of people are like are focused on the United States. God save the United States. But I'm saying, God, come rescue the world. And there's a sense of approaching crisis on our earth, Amen. 
like I mentioned, in chapter 4 and 5, we see John in the throne room of, of, of grace and mercy. We see him with, with God. And, and one thing is that everything is in God's hands. And this week, we're going to get into the four horsemen. Yeah, ooh, ooh. you like it? Now, everybody looks, at, you can go online and look at pictures of, of, of the four horsemen. There's a lot of weird ones out there. But they said the symbolic depiction of things that are going to happen take place in the end times. Um, we see that the four horsemen, like I said, you see a lot of different pictures of the four horsemen. Uh, you see them in paintings, movies, and me media. There's, mo I mean, everything. But there's an intimate, or intimate uh, means of disaster coming to pass. What's amazing is, is God's releasing this. This is not out of his hands. This is not out of his control. It's terrifying when you think about it, but they're only bringing the initial beginning. It gets worse. Just for all the horror brought by the four horsemen, there's much more. Now, if you're a pre-tripper, you, you don't have to worry about it. We'll be already in God's presence. If you're a mid trevor you're going to go through it for a little bit. And if you don't believe one until the end, well, you're going to go through it all. So wherever you stand on that, I mean, as we go through the whole book of Revelation. But let's go to Revelation chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. Now, John, remember John last time began to weep. Who's going to open up the scroll? Who's going to break the seals? And we know that Jesus steps in. He says, now I watched when the Lamb opened the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures say with a voice like thunder, come. Put yourself in his position where he's at. He's seeing things from his own perspective, how he sees them. I look and behold, a white horse and its rider had a bow, and the crown was given to him, and he came out conquering and to conquer. Now, there are people who think, well, this is Jesus. This is not Jesus. One clue would be this. No one, say no one, no. summons Jesus. The writer of chapter 6 is summoned by the one of the living creatures. Can you imagine in your prayers that you summon Jesus? Can you imagine the audacity of people commanding Jesus? And here we see that whoever this is, is as it begins to be released... Here he comes. Now, the conquering Christ of chapter 19 is same kind of symbol. It's I'm looking like. But the rider on this white horse bears some remembrance to the appearance of Jesus on the great white horse in chapter 19. Both are riding white horses. Both wear crowns. Both have a conquest. But this one suggests it's something that looks like Jesus, but it's not. And I began to think about that in my own personal life. Do I show the real Christ? Do I show the real Christ? And I know many of you may be already anticipating, I'm going to say, doubtless, this is the Antichrist. That brings us to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. It says, Let no one deceive you in any way, for the day will come, or not come, unless the rebellion comes first. And the man of lawlessness is revealed in the son of destruction. Jump down to verse 8, same chapter. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. Imagine just Jesus speaking forth. Remember, Satan is a created fallen angel. In John 5, verse 43, he's this. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you will receive him. So we know that, and even in the end times, even in today, people are going to fall for the tricks and the schemes of the, of, of the Antichrist. That's going to happen. And this writer comes in like Christ, but in his own name. He's giving a bow, but no mentions of any arrows. It appears that to be maybe a bloodless conquest he launches. I think maybe it's, it's, it's overpowering of the minds or the wills of men. Maybe without physical destruction. How was it done? 
Maybe he brings the world together in diplomacy, but not war, but with diplomacy. And then he plunges the world into war, which will end up in famine. And we'll see later on in this chapter. Maybe it's some form of deceit by lying and misleading and deceiving men. And thus overcomes people without the shedding of blood. If you, if you remember back in where Matthew, or, yeah, Matthew wrote, Matthew 24 where Jesus is talking to his disciples and before Jerusalem was sieged by Rome, he says in uh, Matthew 24, verse 4, he says this, and, and it says, see that no one leads you astray. Now that verse speaks to them back then, but it also speaks to us. Would you be able to tell if it is the Antichrist? Would you be able to discern what is of God and what's not of God? Is this your way of preparing for what's to come? We are hardly aware of how much we are deceived in our day. Turn on the television, fraudulent ideas mixed with truth. Do you ever get a story or see something maybe on a movie or TV and you see a little bit of truth and a, and a little bit of lie mixed in? And all that stuff is poured into your brain. And, and it's how do you... How do you separate what is truth, what is lie? And I'm hoping you use the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, tell me what is right, what is wrong. Pick up a magazine, a newspaper. We see false claims or, you know, buy something and you'll be blessed. But you find out it's a lie. Here's a magic pill that'll make you feel young again. It's kind of like the snake salesman back in the old days. At the back of a truck, used to sell some snake oil. Drink this, it'll cure everything. But we are constantly offered much of a promise, but never to deliver. And this is what Satan does. Many young people, do you guys ever see the commercials where you see this uh, uh, extraordinary good looking woman coming down in a, in a slinky dress holding some kind of perfume or cologne and she's walking towards the camera and she said, you know, playing on the minds of people, spray this on and men will come running to you or even if it's a guy who comes out and, you know, he's got that um, with a shirt buttoned on to his belly and he got a hairy chest and he says, spray this cologne and, and this, you'll get any woman in the world. Doesn't work. But we are living in a deceitful age. And that rider on the white horse tells us, however, that the worst is about to come. We're living amidst a great deceit. It's true. It's not as bad as it's going to be. Just imagine if our country in its next vote thinks and, and our, our candidate doesn't win and we think it's another stolen election. Imagine the pressure in this country is going to explode and you're going to have masses of anarchy. It's kind of like when Jesus came, they thought he was going to remove Rome and he didn't. Imagine if our candidate doesn't win, the anarchy is going to happen. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 9 through 12 says this, The coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan with all power and false signs and wonder. So you know he's going to do this. And with all wicked deception of, for those who are perishing because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. Therefore, God sends them in a strong delusion so that they may believe what is False. Oh, God wouldn't do that. In order that all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure on, in unrighteousness. Paul points to Satan as the evil person who will bring the man of lawlessness to power, who what? Will do false signs and wonders. But according to Scripture, and we'll get into that next week, is God will raise up other witnesses to the truth in the tribulation from the tribes of Israel. 144,000 Jews will believe on Christ and evangelize the lost. Amen? So the first horse, the first release of the scrolls is deception. Let's go to the second one. Revelations chapter 6, verse 3 and 4. 
And when he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come. And out came another horse, bright red, and this rider was permitted to take peace from the earth so that people should slay one another. And he was given a great sword. Depict what, what John is seeing. The rider is easy to recognize. It's war, of course, but not war between great armies, not at least at first. The word slay really means to slaughter. It's a reference to maybe civil war, civil anarchy, where mobs of people group together to attack and destroy other people whom they do not like. Did you hear the news the other day about people who are squatting in vacant homes or homes for sale? Now there's vigilantes out there doing what the law will not do. The rider on the red horse takes peace from the earth worldwide, not just the United States, racial strife, gang wars in cities. We can go on and on, but he causes other people just to kill one another. Look what's going on just even in the city of New York from the policies they have. It's amazing that people are just, they don't care. But it says, to him was given a large sword. In the days when John seen this, he wrote obviously that they didn't have mega bombs. They didn't have dirty bombs. They didn't have missiles. They didn't have tanks. They didn't have airplanes, but such weapons of destruction in terms of understanding that day. So they understood a great sword means something that was great and powerful. So for us, what is a powerful weapon? A powerful weapon can be even your voice, the words you say. So then it takes us to the third seal, Revelation 6, 5 through 6. And when he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come. And I looked, and behold, a black horse. And its rider had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard what it seemed to be a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for Daenerys and three quarts of barley for Daenerys. And do not harm the oil and the wine. Now, most scholars take this to be reference to widespread famine on the earth. They say that their scales symbolize food being weighed out carefully in such a way to short supply that must be rational. We have seen some of these things already. We've already seen deception. We've already seen anarchy. We've already seen hate. We've already seen killing. We've already seen famine in some, in some places. This is intensified. This is something that affects in the multitudes. And even though that no one can get very much because of the day's wages to earn a single quart of wheat because it's cheaper than barley, this would only be enough food for one person per day. You would work all day long and the best you would earn is enough to feed yourself one meal. Nothing for your family. But the luxuries like the oil and the wine are untouched for the wealthy. But you ask, what else can cause terrible shortages and great high prices so that people cannot adequately buy enough food? Inflation. Inflation. Economics out of control. Panic in the marketplace. I'm a, I like, I like, uh, I always liked the time period between 1900s to about 1950s. I loved that time period. And I always got interested in, I um, always started the war, like World War I and World War II. I started actually picking up die cast metals again when I was a younger of just some of the things that they had then. And there's a story I remember in World War I. I remember um, in history class, accounts of people taking thousands of what they called German marks was their currency in, in wheelbarrows and loading them to wheelbarrows and take them to the market to buy a loaf of bread. And understand, even after a war, the, inf the, this, the inflation of things have cost. It makes money worthless. You know, look at our own society, our culture today. Go back a few years and how things cost and now how much things cost today. 
Even in life after World War II, I was completely shocked how hard and difficult it was for Europe to get back on its feet, not just Germany, but Italy, England, France, and all the countries that were involved in World War II. How many people suffered because of a result of what Adolf Hitler had did? Do you ever wonder, just on a side note, Adolf Hitler, his Aryan race, the thousand-year Reich, and Jesus, a thousand-year uh, millennial reign? Do you understand how he wanted to be? In September 2021, a, a gentleman named David Beasley, he's the executive director of the United Nations Food World Program. So this is a few years old. So he says, there is a $400 trillion worth of wealth in the earth today. $400 trillion. And the fact that he said 9 million people die from hunger every year. He said, shame on us in his report. He said, in the height of COVID, billionaires' net worth increase was $5.2 billion per day. At the same time, 24,000 people died of hunger every day. He said, shame on us. He said, every hour, the net worth of billionaires during COVID, or the height of COVID, was substantial, $216 million per hour. What would you do with $216 million per hour? And yet, 1,000 people per hour were dying of hunger. And it went on, the report went on. So understand, when, when the extent of the famine, it will be worldwide. But, everybody say but. Doesn't mean that there will be a sh real shortage of food. We know that our leaders have not always told the truth in our country, amen? We need to pray for them. But it means that the governments can create shortages in order to force people to do as the government wants. You mean in the United States? I said, yep. Even in the United States. If people were led to believe that things were only... I mean, if people were led to believe that these things were the only way to fairly distribute the limited food and receive the mark, that means they can buy something to eat. Hunger is a very powerful weapon. Now think about this. In turn becomes an excuse for the rigid controls over buying and selling, which we will find in chapter 13 under the reign of the Antichrist. The whole world is subjected to enormously restrictive controls so that no one can buy or sell without the mark of the beast. That, that's true. We think about starving, and yet there's people around the world that don't have anything anything. So imagine the little commercials of the little kids with the, the, their legs look like pencils and they got bloated stomachs. And we cry sometimes, I'm starving, I'm hungry. Amen, pastor. Thank you for this depressing service. <laughs> but I'm bringing you a truth and reality that things are going to happen. They're going to get worse. And God's in control. And you're like, well, how's it God? It's judgment. He's given us as a society, a world, enough grace, don't you think? Which brings us to Revelation chapter 6, verse 7 and 8. And when he opened the fourth seals, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, come. And I looked and behold, a pale horse and the rider's name was Death and Hades followed him. And they were given authority over the force of the earth to kill the sword, with the sword and f with famine and with pestilence and by wild beasts of the earth. If you're a hunter out there, there's deer coming for you. Now listen, if I was John and I seen this, how many of us would have been like, whoa, wait a minute, God, this is enough, man. Now death in Hades comes. The rider's name is Death, and floating behind was a fear identified as Hades. Death of the flesh, death of the spirit. Death rides the horse, but Hades follows in the hearse. The sword, 
which is here is not murder, but injury will assault upon one another. People taking the law in their own hands, murdering other people without regard or justice or law, when murder becomes famine and widespread starvation. Imagine how hungry you are, and you have a family, you have no food, but yet you see somebody else who has everything. Imagine what would you be willing to do in this time? Would you be able to go on with a gun and start shooting people to feed your family? And this is the, the anarchy that's going to happen on the earth. When civilizations begin to crumble, defenses of mankind against diseases are lost as well. Whole populations are decimated by plagues. There may be a reference here of biological wet warfare, willing to spread diseases among people so that they are wiped out in masses. People by the millions starving to death will die because of different plagues, unchecked sickness. Many believe even AIDS is a plague, the stupidity of man, even now who have smallpox stored up. The World Health Organization has told you that smallpox was a thing of the past. Yes, they created COVID-19 and released it into the world. Don't think your governments in the world are innocent. I don't know about you, but I've noticed the strains of flu have been even getting worse over the past few years. I'm not a conspiracy. Oh, this is somebody that's real and looks at the news. Wild beasts on the earth will multiply. Humans are subjected to attack to these predators. I didn't say that. The scripture did. Because they're going to be hungry. It's difficult to know whether it's geographic or demographic division of the earth. A fourth of the globe is decimated in these terrible plagues. Think about this. This is what I looked up as, as I looked. It says there is approximately 8.1 billion people on the earth today. Roughly. That would mean 2 billion, 250 million people would be dead. Let's put that in perspective. China, all of China, all of Japan, all of North and South Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and the United States would be decimated by disease. Imagine all the people wiped out. It's a picture of desolate earth caused by man's hatred and barbarity. These four judgments are, are a reference to the force that are already worked among, like I mentioned. These things are already happening. It just gets intensified and multiplied. But God is the one allowing it for his plan and his purpose. The four seals confirm God's announced method of making men face up to the truth. But how does it make us stop hiding our heads and refusing to face reality? by allowing evil to have its full steam ahead. Remember in Romans, it declares that he delivered men over to their own passions, their own evil. He allows the unrestricted manifestations of what man really wanted. God teaches us to face up the pleasant truth about giving us what we demand. How many of us have ever asked and pushed God for something and he says, okay, have it, and you end up falling on your face when he says, I had a better plan for you. They want to believe the lie, right? The lie of the Antichrist is powerful and delusional. If men seeks to kill and destroy and refuse to see the evil that's in them, and then we'll see widespread anarchy, mob rule, ultimately nuclear destruction. If men demand power and control, what they're given is intrigue, murder, disease, and desolation of the earth. These things cannot be stopped because they are inescapable consequences of the evil in mankind. Last week when I, when I said um, that when Christ rose from the grave, that is a truth. The scripture as it unfolds is the truth. This is going to happen. That is a truth. And it's not meant to scare you. It's meant for us to be celebrated because God's in control. Amen? See, God's working in the midst of the judgment with the four horsemen. So now let's open the fifth seal, verse 9 through 11. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altars of the souls who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. They cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign, holy, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? 
Then they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and brothers should be complete who were to be killed as they themselves had been. Do you hear that last verse? Until the number of their fellow servants, God is going to get all who are seeking him. There's enough grace. The souls under the altar recognize God's absolute right to have the, allow them to have martyrdom. They address him as sovereign. They also attest to his holy character being holy. God cannot commit any wrongdoing. There are souls who they have been killed and there are souls who have died a violent death. These souls have those who have been stoned, they have been beheaded, they have been hanged, they have been sawn in two. These are souls who those who have been burned as lamps, those who have been thrown to the lions, those who have been counted as sheep for the slaughter. These are the souls of those who have been slain for the gospel. But not only are we seeing in our world today the rise of anti-Semitism on the stage, we see now anti-Christian sentiment with such anger and hatred. Hostility is on the rise. Not just in the last week, but I've seen more just in the next few years, this more persecution of the Christian church and as Christians as we get older. How dare we think that we shouldn't get the persecution when there's people around the world who are giving their lives for Christ? I know, amen. Thank you, Pastor. And we should expect that in the United States, though, which I believe is crumbling right before our very eyes. So my heart is that you and I would be so strong in the word that we would stand strong. We're grinded in his word because there are darker times coming for America. And I'm not saying for us, though. I'm a tree pre-Trevor. I'm believing we're going to see this from the mezzanine down. I believe we're going to be praising him and worshiping him. But notice the prayer of these martyrs, they pray. It's a call for vengeance. It's quite different from the prayer of Christians who are expected to pray for their enemies, is it? Are we not supposed to pray for those who despitefully use us? In Luke 23, verse 34, it says, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. When Stephen was first martyred, he saw the Lord, and he was being stoned. He said in Acts 7, verse 60, and falling on his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep or he died. Could we be like Stephen? Someone's stoning us, throwing rocks at us. He's asking that his murders were be forgiven, for they do not know what they were doing. And that is to be the prayer for believers today, for those who persecute them or take an unfair advantage of them. Lord, open their eyes. Lord, rescue them from themselves. Lord, rescue them before they pick eternity away from you. How many of us remember the story of uh, Nate Saint back in 1956? Many of you won't know. Rachel Saint, the sister of Nate Saint, one of the five men martyred in Ecuador in 1956, as they attempted to communicate with the Harani in Ecuador, a tribe. Um, later, Rachel Saint and her companions went back to the tribe to live among these killers. Understand, they, the, the men went to witness, and they died. What's interesting is that these women knew that what the Scripture taught. So what they did was they served them, they loved them, and they taught the gospel to them, even till they won them to Christ, the very men who killed her brother. Could you serve somebody that murdered one of your family members? And in this interview, she said, why did you go, the interview said, why did you go back to this tribe? See, because she said, in Indian culture, they live for vengeance. But as a Christian, I knew that forgiveness is our message for those who injure us. She said, most of the tribe became believers through the faithful ministry of these women. Some told me even today, however, though the young are leaving the tribe and they were caught up in the lies of the world, and most of them are losing their foundation and their heritage in Christianity. Wow. Powerful testimony. 
But the scripture said they were given a white robe. And they were committed to rest. The white robe is the a righteousness of Christ. They had been liberated by Christ. They were consecrated by Christ. They were set apart for Christ. And they had been crowned by the Lamb and the righteousness of the Lamb. God who has the power to step in and end this whole thing. Instead, he chooses to allow this play out in all the gruesome detail. How many of us would look at it and say, God, where is your mercy in this, in this land? We need to start thing, looking things through God's eyes. Although we will never fully understand God's divine patience, we know that it's explained in part his great mercy towards those who have not yet turned to him. If God would stop right now, in vengeance of the time of their request, some would be eternally lost that needed to come to him first. And sometimes we say, God, what is taking you so long? Why haven't you come yet? Because there's many other people that have to come to him first. And we, as a body, need to be praying for grace and mercy. Maybe you have a, an, un, un, an unloving uh, family member, or, or maybe you have uh, neighbors, or whatever it may be. And maybe God's just waiting for you to do what you're supposed to do, is witness the gospel to them. Not saying you're going to get a spear stuck in you to kill you, but yet they may say things verbally, but yet you and I need to be in a place where we're witnessing the, of Christ, sharing the gospel of Christ. Which brings us to Revelation 6, verse 12 through 14. And when he opened his sixth seal, I looked, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth, and a full moon became like blood. And the stars fell from the, to the earth as a fig tree sheds its winter fruit when it's shaken by the gale. The sky vanquished like a scroll that is being rolled up, and every mountain and island was removed from this place. Imagine how John's feeling right about now. Now, I know I kind of joked about the, the eclipse, but there are people who, I mean, we went to Sam's Club yesterday in Ohio. I, that place was packed from people who were preparing for some great disaster that's coming on the earth because they listen to people's lies, conspiracy theories. Now, not that God can't do through something through this, and hey, I hope he does. But just because we have something like if you're going to go to that and watch it, go have fun. I mean, God created everything for our enjoyment, Right? So to see that happening in the sky would be pretty cool. Don't look up and do it, though, they say. Unless you wear your glasses. But here, this is all thought out, planned from God to happen. It's a vivid description of chaos in nature. The whole nature will go in a rampage. I remember a movie, I think it was, was it 2012? My daughter would never watch. If you ever watch it, 2012 is about the end times. It's not a Christian-based movie. Um, but it was, you get a kind of an idea what it's going to be like on the earth. The, the earth just starts erupting and land masses are falling, buildings are going down, and people have nowhere to go. And in, in the movie, there's a couple stars that are in the movie who are trying to make it to some hidden base from the governments had planned so they can escape with the government. I mean, they end up there anyways, but spoiler. But it says in Matthew 24, verse 29 and 30, it says this, And immediately after tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. To me, when I hear that, I just hear God just clearing his throat. <clears throat> Straighten it out now. And then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, for they will see the Son of Man coming on a cloud of heaven with power and great glory. I just got the chills on that one. These six seals have carried utmost in the very end the whole seven-year period. Now, later we're going to get into the trumpets. There's a whole thing coming 
The great tribulation in nature will upset some of the cosmic phenomenon. Perhaps it's an approach of an undetected heavenly body that will upset the gravity of the earth. We don't know. Volcanoes may go up. We don't know. Maybe spotting lava. Uh, the rumbles of the earth. The stars will appear to be falling from the sky, darkened of the sun and the moon will result in ashes and dust covering the earth. It's going to be unbearable down here. This will be a time of terror and anguish to the earth. What will be the effect on the people? Imagine yourself being in that place. Darkness everywhere, not just physically, but, but spiritually. Ash, kind of like we'll say, a nuclear winter everywhere. Death and destruction all around the place. And what's amazing about this is that it doesn't say how many people come to Christ. You think after seeing devastation, how hard are the hearts of the people against God not to repent just during the first six seals? You know, like John would say, you know, God, this is so much. How hard is it for us to fall to our knees and ask God for repentance? God, forgive me. Have mercy on me. Rescue me from myself. Which brings us to Revelation 15, verse 17. Then the kings of the earth and the great ones and the generals and the rich and the powerful and everyone slave and free hid themselves in caves and among the rocks of the mountains. Calling to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. You think people would surrender? For a great day of their wrath has come. Who can stand? Who can stand? That's the question left hanging in the air. Of course, no one can. If it's the end of the world as we know it, why are you running to the mountains? Where are you going to hide? How can you hide from God? How do we hide from God in our lives today? We can't. <clears throat> All people who have yet not believed in Christ, who have refused his offer of grace, are subjected to the terrible catastrophes and cry out in desperate fear. God, I want to live my way, my way, my life. Why can't you just leave me alone? Here's the result of your, of your life. In those days, those who refuse to believe have reached the stage where they cannot believe. Their hearts are seared against God. Those who do not repent and pray for the Lord's salvation, rather they feel a terrible fear and pray, let the rocks destroy me. They will manifest open and publicly what they feel privately and secretly today. That every unbeliever is convinced of his own heart that death is somehow an escape in oblivion. Even if you die, you're still going to stand before God. Somehow they think they can escape the terrible consequences of their evil by dying. That's why people commit suicides. They believe they're escaping their problems, that there will be no consequences beyond death. They can't deal with it on the earth, so they figured if they die, they don't have to deal with it. But there's consequences for our actions anytime. This will be a reference. Hebrews 9, verse 27 says, and, and just as it is appointed to man to die once, and after that comes judgment. So it's not about God being a mean God. It's about God's plan. Listen, I've given you so much time. I've given you all this grace. You refuse my love. You refuse my grace. You, forgive for, you refuse my mercy. And now here's what your consequences of those refusal things are. And we wonder in life, in our life, how does this happen to us? It's like we refuse to listen to what the Holy Spirit says and for us to do. And we just, God, why are you punishing me? Why do you discipline me? He says, I discipline those who I love. And yet we reject them. And we wonder why. We do something stupid. We wonder why we pay. 
It's our consequences. I think it's every action, there's a reaction. Why are we told these terrible truths? Because if we belong to the Lord now and are a member of his body, the true church, we won't be part of this scene. Can we recognize evil while it still looks good? Can I have the worship team come up? Are we able to change ourselves in a sense to give ourselves what we reject? Are our hearts so hard that we can't surrender to Christ? In John chapter 3, verse 36, it says, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. For me, I don't like preaching these passages, but I love to see the worldviews of, of John in the, in the heavens and it's the temple and in heaven, seeing all the angels and all the, the, the people praising God and worshiping God, but there is coming a day of the wrath of God. God just can't let everything just happen. There's a day coming when God, the wrath of God must be poured upon the unrighteousness of men. And it's to that day that we have come. Let us sure, be sure that there is none of us with an evil, unrepentant heart. We need to be in a place that we're repentant. Luke, which brings us to Luke 22, verse 19 through 20. And this is why we celebrate communion. So can I have the people come up from communion and set things up? It says in Luke 22, verse 19 and 20, it says, And he took the bread... And when he gave thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. And verse 20 says, And likewise, the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is a new covenant in my blood. We celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. We celebrate in communion. We partake in communion. And in Corinthians, it talks about us examining ourselves, and we need to examine ourselves. Or are we part of his church, the true church? Remember, the true church doesn't have denominations, okay? True church doesn't have denominations. We need to look inside. And see, as this church, we observe the communion as both, it's a blessing... And it's a biblical mandate. It's two ordinances of Jesus, what he gave. Also, the other one being baptized. And I think every Christian denomination probably celebrates both water baptism and communion. You know, whether our services for communion are or ornate or really spe or spectacular or just simple, basic, traditional, or modern. It's important that we make the most of its observance we are thoughtful, meaningful. Why do we celebrate communion? And I think, I think when we, we come to the realization that each of us, we all deserve hell, but yet God shed his grace and gave it mercy in us. And through his mercy and grace, we are able to have eternity with him and not separation. I think when we sit there and we say, I'm not such a bad person, I'm not that bad, you know, it's the other people are worse than me, we're only fooling ourselves because that's pride. You know, in my times, in my private time, I say, God, why did you pick me? I know how I am. And all I hear is, I love you, and we'll, we'll, we'll straighten you out. And communion to me is something that's it's special. But God, he chose to do what he wanted to do, what the Father said. He wanted to rescue us. Now, 
even when he prayed in Gethsemane, let this cup pass from me, but not my will, Lord, but your will. He willingly went, maybe there's something like that up there, not sure. But he did it for you and me so that we don't have to go through his judgment. We've already been judged 2,000 years ago. So I'm going to ask you to, to pray, search your heart. If there's anything that would stop you from coming to receive communion, make it right with God. And then come up the center aisles and go up the sides and we'll, we'll take communion together. Tony, can you turn all the lights on? So whenever you're ready, come on up. Everyone been served that wants to be served? The bread. Luke 22, verse 19 says, And he took the bread, gave thanks, and he broke, and he gave them, saying, This is my body given to, for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Imagine all the things you, that you see in life, all the things. And here's a man willingly gave up his life for you and me. We remember the stripes on our behalf. We remember under, what, the, the, the suffering underneath the soldiers, the laughing, the mocking, the crown that was jammed into his head the betrayal of his own believers and his crucifixion. We remember the death. 
There's nothing supernatural about the bread itself. It's just bread. It's Italian bread. But it should remind you of the strong Savior we have and what he did for us. We take this, we eat this in remembrance. Something solemn. Let's take the bread. says in the same way after the supper he took the cup saying this is the cup of my new covenant in my blood which is poured out for you so many times we sing that old song that there's power in the blood I find myself catching and singing that there is power power wonder working power I don't think any more precious words can be said. The power of the blood washes our sins away. It brings healing to our souls. In that, in that blood, we have hope. We have forgiveness. We have peace. We have salvation. We are truly made whole. when I think about the blood, it reminds me of the cost of that sacrifice. That he gave it all. That we could be sons and daughters. That we could be accepted back. That we could be washed clean. That we could be made new. That rift that was caused by our sin is now bridged by, the, by Jesus outstretching his arms on Calvary. So as we take this morning, remember the price that was paid for you and I. Now, Father, I thank you, Lord God, that we can celebrate, not just go through the motions, not just do it because that's what we're doing and we, this is when we do it, but God, that we can truly celebrate the table of the Lord that we can celebrate the fact that you went to Calvary for me, that I could be washed clean, that I could be grafted in, that you paid my debt that I could not pay, that you took it upon yourself, that I could be made whole. I thank you for that, oh God, and I don't take that lightly. I thank you for that price that you paid for me. And Father God, I pray that even as we go into this last song, that you would be glorified, oh God. That in the words that I speak, even outside of this building, Lord God, that you would be glorified. That my actions... God, even as my husband said at the very beginning, what Christ do we represent? What Christ do we show? But God, that even as, as, as we go about our days, Lord God, that we would represent you well, that we would reflect your glory, your love. God, I thank you for who you are. We give you glory and honor. And God, as we worship you, I pray that you would be glorified and lifted up in Jesus name come on let's stand to our feet and sing one last song together
so beautiful, Lord. Your, your name is so beautiful. And Father God, this morning we just, we continue, Lord, just to submit our hearts, God, to surrender our agendas, the control that we want to hold. And we, we just lift up our hands and sing. God, you are worthy of all the glory, the honor, the praise. Father God, this morning, God, we just thank you. God, we thank you for your word. God, we thank you for your grace, your mercy, your love, your forgiveness. God, your unconditional love. And Father God, this morning, we just thank you. We praise you. We stand in awe of who you are. God, we can never say thank you enough. God, our words will never be enough to express, Lord, the gratitude, the praise, the honor that you deserve. And Father God, this morning, we just ask you, Lord, that your words would be sealed upon our hearts, Lord, that, that God, we would stand forth or stand firm, God, in your word, in your scripture, and what you have spoken. God, that you would embolden us, God, give us the confidence to share, Lord, your, your gospel, God, to share your name. God, when all things are dark, God, you are the light in the darkness. You are the light that pushes back, breaks the darkness. And God, we thank you. God, we thank you for what's to come. God, that your glory would be revealed. But God, we just give you the glory, the honor, the praise. And it's only because of your precious holy name. You know, the altars are never closed. That if you want to come surrender in the presence, then we would love to pray and support and encourage you. But if not, we will see you guys Wednesday night for kids, Bible study, and youth. Um, if not, we will see you guys Friday, game night. And then if not, next Sunday, be blessed.